and it is our sixth anniversary this weekend. I can't believe Return Church has been around for six years. That's amazing. Telling Brother David, it just doesn't seem like six years. It just seems like just the other day we started a church, and we didn't really know how to start a church, didn't know what to do. We just trusted the Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and direct our every step, and here we are six years later. So we're, we're so blessed. We really are. God has done miraculous things, and we're just blessed in a big way. I've got some special friends here today. Mark and Dawn are here all the way from Jasper, Indiana. Would you all give them a hand clap? Just make them feel welcome. So good to see you guys. Amen. And uh, there was something else I needed to mention. The, uh, oh, next weekend, Easter Sunday, Sister Elaine uh, just mentioned that. That's a big day of the year for our church, so... Make plans to attend. You won't want to miss that. We'll have a very special service on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Brother Chad will be wound up and ready to go. It, it'll be powerful service. So don't miss next Sunday on Easter, Easter Sunday. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm going to talk to you today about something that's not easy to talk about. Might make some of y'all mad at me, but that's all right. I'm, I'm preaching to myself. This is, that's all right. This whole thing. <laughs> I'm just preaching to myself, and uh, I've been studying. I've read a couple books, one by Dr. R.T. Kendall and one by Peter Haas on self-righteousness, the subject of self-righteousness. Are you all okay with we, we deal with that? And uh, the, the, so, and I got that, that, some of those thoughts are inspired by those two books I read. This one guy said, we might need a fair sectomy, you know, we might... <laughs> There might be a little bit of the Pharisee still living inside of us. And uh, so when I talk about the Pharisee today, I don't want you to be thinking about somebody else. And you think, oh boy, they need to hear this sermon. I'm going to share this sermon on Facebook with them because they need to hear it. That won't do you a bit of good. I want you to think about yourself when I'm talking about this, okay? This big subject of self-righteousness. So we'll just dive right in. When you think about the original sin... Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Instead of eating of the tree of life, they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when they did, their spiritual eyes were closed, their natural eyes came open, and they immediately became self-centered instead of Christ-centered. Instead of putting God in the center of their life and serving Him, they took the center of their own life, became self-centered, and they also became self-righteous. Adam and Eve, one of the very first things they did was become self-righteous because see what I've learned from witnessing the, the lost people when you're witnessing to the lost and you want to lead them to Jesus they got to understand they need Jesus and over 90 percent of the people that I personally have witnessed to when I ask them a question like are you going to go to heaven or hell if you died today where would you go and they'll say heaven and then you ask them why you know what they'll tell you I'm a good person I, I help people. I've never murdered anybody. You know, these are the common answers that I receive. You hardly ever, ever stumble upon someone and you ask them the question, well, if you die today, will you go to heaven or hell? You hardly ever hear anyone say, oh no, I'm going to hell. I've broken the law of God. I've broken the Ten Commandments. I know I'm, on, I'm condemned. I'm on my way to hell. Please help me find a Savior. You don't hear that because they are so self-righteous and they don't even know it. It's their default mechanism in their own soul. I'm good. Don't, oh, I'm good. I hadn't done so, so many bad things. So we're born that way. Babies are born that way. You and I were born that way, full of self-righteousness. Self-righteousness simply means you don't need God to make you righteous because you can be righteous on your own. You, you've got enough goodness inside of you. You can make yourself right with God apart from Jesus Christ. I'm telling you right now, it's impossible. There is no righteousness apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. He is our righteousness. He's the righteous one. So this original sin is a problem. We were born, we know we're born self-centered, but I want you to think about it, that you were born self-righteous. Self-righteous. And soon as, and, and many people, you know, will display that in a thousand different ways in their life. But even Christians, because if we all still got a little bit of self-centeredness in us, and we do, 
We all still got a little bit of pride in us, and we do. Does anybody out here have no pride at all? No, that's good that you know that. <laughs> in our souls, we still got some pride in us, and we still got this self-righteous thing. So this, these last three weeks of study, and it's just it's set me free to a new place of intimacy. We were singing this morning. Boy, Brother Vince and worship team, big, big kudos to you guys today. That was fantastic. <laughs> Darren started singing about the wonderful cross. <laughs> then, then we sang about in the cross, <laughs> in the cross. And I realize all over again, you know, that's what makes me righteous. It's the cross of Jesus. It's what Jesus did 2,000 years ago that makes me righteous. It's not my deeds. It's not my good behavior. It's not all the good, good thinking I can do. No, it's what he did. It's all about the cross. Adam and Eve, what they did after they sinned, they blamed each other. I'll read that scripture in Genesis 3. If I could dim the lights just a little bit, I can see better. The man said, God, God you know, came to him, and Adam said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. It's Liz's fault, God. It's not me. <laughs> if you hadn't given me that woman, I wouldn't have got in trouble here a bit. And then the Lord said to the woman, What have you done? And she said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. You know, if, if it weren't for that snake, you know, he did it to me. The man's pointing the finger at the woman. The woman pointing the finger at the serpent. What were they doing? They were shifting the blame. Why? Because they wanted to be right. They were so self-righteous, they couldn't even admit to, okay, I messed up. No. When you shift the blame or you're defensive, do you ever get defensive when people are on you sometimes when they're after you? That's self-righteousness. That's an automatic default mechanism in your soul that you default to. No, they made me do it. In other words, they thought they were righteous because they shifted the blame or the wrong onto another, blaming others. You remember the parable in the Bible about the two lost sons? Most people talk about this. They call it the parable of the prodigal son. But there's a bigger story here because there's two sons involved in the parable. The prodigal son left his father. He took his inheritance early. He squandered it all. The Bible says on righteous living, probably drunk, drunkenness, alcohol, and drugs, and harlots, just probably gambling. Who, who knows? He, he, he blew it all in no time. And he wound up in a pig pen. The Bible says he came to himself, and he wanted to go back to his father's home. So he took a step back toward the father, and the father saw him and ran from a long ways off. The father ran and hugged him, fell on his neck, and put a robe on him, and put shoes on his feet, and a ring on his finger, and killed the fatted calf, and had a big party, and let's celebrate, because the prodigal son had come home. But then there was that brother, that big brother, and he got really angry at this whole thing. He was self-righteous. Look what he did. I'll read it this way. I think I can see it. Luke 15, 28. He was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgress your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, not my brother... This son of yours came, who's devoured your livelihood with harlots. You killed the fatted calf for him. See, he was unrepentant, and he was self-righteous. So whether you're religious or irreligious, the prodigal son was irreligious, and he was lost, but he got saved in the story. The big brother was religious, and it shows no no repentance. I don't, he never got saved in the story at all. He was in worse shape than the prodigal son, even though he was the religious one. To say, I've never transgressed your commandments. See, that's, you see the, the level of self-righteousness there? And it's a blindness. 
I want to talk about the Pharisees. There's a contrast in the Bible. Jesus hung out with sinners all the time. But he was always on these Pharisees. He was against these Pharisees. These Pharisees, I mean, he showed, you would think, I could use the word no mercy, but his nature is merciful. So just the justice of God and the judgment of God and the truth of God all would come out when he would attack these Pharisees. Why would he attack them so bad? Because they they were full of the self-righteousness thing. And until you see self-righteousness as a sin on an equal level, with other sins like adultery or murder or covetousness, greed. You know, self-righteousness is just as bad of a sin, but it's, it's usually clothed in religion. So you don't recognize it as that kind of sin and you don't think it smells that way. But, but when you look at the words of Jesus and his attitude toward the Pharisees, you remember on Palm Sunday, this is Palm Sunday, the day we... Uh, celebrate that. It's one week in front of Easter Sunday. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Remember that? And all the people, they started worshiping. They put their clothes on the ground, the palm branches, and they were saying, Hosanna, blessed be the king that comes in the name of the Lord. Well, who got mad at that? Pharisees. Pharisees. They said, you get your disciples to stop this at once. They thought it was blasphemous that they were giving him praise. And Jesus said, if they stop, if they quiet now, the stones are going to cry out and start singing praise. Palm Sunday, the Pharisees were angry. Jesus was always on them. And I'm just going to read you some scriptures to show you. Here's the the parable he taught on the, the, the publican and the Pharisee shows the contrast I'm talking about between the sinners and the religious, the irreligious and the religious, the publican or the tax collector and the Pharisee. Jesus said he spoke the parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So he was saying this parable about the Pharisee and the publican to the Pharisees. He was trying to get their eyes open. He said, a Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Just stop right there. (laughs) You ever pray thinking, man, I'm so glad I'm not like these sinners extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. See, the Pharisee thought he was in right standing with God because of his good behavior. He tithed. He was religious. He fasted. He prayed. He studied his Bible. Nothing wrong with these things, I'm telling you. But if you think you do these things to put yourself right with God, then you're self-righteous and you're missing the whole boat. We're saved by grace. It's because of the goodness of God. He imputes his righteousness onto us. He makes us righteous. We get that by faith, by believing in him. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. When we believe God, you're saved by grace through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anybody should boast. So the Pharisees. The, Jesus in 8.15, Mark 8.15, he charged him, said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He's not talking about the natural bread. He's talking about how their teaching or their doctrine to get inside of you like leaven does to bread. It'll ruin your whole uh, theology, your whole ideology, your entire belief system can get messed up with this Pharisaical thinking. And this is why I'm preaching this again. I'm, I want to relive this again in my own thought life. You know, I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want any self-righteousness. I just want more gratitude for the cross, more gratitude for what Jesus died to give me, more gratitude for the blood of the Lamb of God. That's what I want to live in. That will produce righteous living. When you're grateful for the grace of God, when God just takes his grace and drenches yes. our sinful souls with it <laughs> and makes us righteous, and you're grateful for that, that will produce righteous living. Amen. If your righteous living's coming out of a motive of you trying to set yourself right with God, apart from Jesus Christ, then you're missing the whole boat. Aramaic word for Pharisee, guess what it means? Separatism, or one who is separated. One who is separated. That's what they were. They were a separated people. 
The Bible says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. How many? None. None. Isaiah 64. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. So our own self-righteousness is like filthy rags in the eyes of God. Self-righteousness is as bad of a sin as adultery, murder, or greed. You don't think you need God because you've set yourself. you got yourself to make you righteous. So I'm going to read in some in Matthew 23. Matthew 23 is the classic text of Jesus versus the Pharisees. This is where he let them have it. It's like, you know, they had tried to kill him. They had tried to throw him off a cliff. They had criticized everything he did, all his teachings. He was always in confrontation with them. But it's like in Matthew 23, it's like enough's enough, and he just let them have it. He just took both barrels of the shotgun and, and blasted them here. So Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So look at this. So practice and obey what they tell you, but don't follow their example. In other words, when they're talking about tithing and praying and fasting, these are good things, but don't follow their example. What did he mean? He says, because they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra-wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear robes with extra-long tassels, and they love to sit at the head table at banquets and in the seats in the honor that, in the synagogue. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplace and to be called rabbi. So they did it all for shows, all about an outward appearance with the Pharisees. Jesus said, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites. You know what a hypocrite is? What that word means in the Greek? An actor. And I, in other words, you're acting. You're pretending. You know, it's easy to talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? Are you the same person at home that you are in church? Is your public life and your private life the same? It, it, integrity is when your private life and your public life are the same. Jesus called them hypocrites. He says, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourself and you don't let others in either. What sorrow awaits you teachers of the religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross land and sea to make one convert and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell as yourself are. Blind guides, what sorrow awaits you? That's tough. This is the same guy that preached the Sermon on the Mount. Same one says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Same one says, do unto others, you would have them do unto you. He came at these Pharisees. Why? Because self-righteousness is a serious thing. If you're blinded by self-righteousness, you can't get saved until you first see that you need Jesus. if, If you're so religious that you don't even think you need Jesus, you're in trouble. Every one of us are a sinner. Every one of us have broken the law of God. Every one of us are in need of the blood of Jesus Christ. I've been saved for over 33 years, and I'm in as much need of the blood of Jesus today as I was 33 years ago. Every day I want to be washed all over again. He said, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, For you're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Yes, you should tithe. You should tithe, yes. But do not neglect the more important things, blind guides. You strain your water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, For you're so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites? And in verse 33, he called them snakes, sons of vipers. How will you escape the judgment of hell? Wow, that's Matthew 23, New Living Translation. I like that translation better. See, there's a difference between religion and real Christianity. Religion is advice. We've talked about that a lot. Well, real Christianity is based on the gospel. Based, it's news. It's good news. It's the greatest news you're ever going to hear in your life. It's about what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. It's not what you do, it's what he did. It's all about the gospel, the good news. Well, religion is going to give you advice on how to live your life. Religion is full of rules, regulations, and rituals. Full of it. Where real Christianity is just about a real relationship with Jesus Christ. A personal, one-on-one, -on -one, intimate relationship with Jesus. That's the substitute. Is religion is the fake where real Christianity is you know, the real thing, this personal relationship with Jesus. Religion focuses on knowledge. Real Christianity focuses on loving God and others. You say, well, what's wrong with knowledge? It's not wrong to have knowledge. But if the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 that you can have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and have enough faith so you can remove a mountain, but if you don't have love, it profits you nothing. Nothing. <laughs> so religion focuses on how much knowledge, how much you can know. But real Christianity focuses on loving God and loving people. Are y'all following that? Religion focuses on the outward appearance. Real Christianity focuses on the inward condition of your heart. Religion folks, has a works-based theology. It's all about what you can do. Real Christianity is a grace-based theology. It's all about what Jesus did. It's all about him giving grace to us. And where religion has a fear-based ideology, it's all based on fear. Where real Christianity has a love-based ideology, everything based on love. What a contrast. And I've learned this over the years. This is so real to me, what I'm talking to you all about. And the last thing I want to be is a Pharisee. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want any more of that. I've, I've been delivered from that. And I, and I want to get 100% delivered from that. I want it all out of my system. You might be a Pharisee if. I got that from uh, raised in South Mississippi. There's this guy who used to do redneck jokes. And, He'd say, you might be a redneck if, you know, like if you mow your grass and find a car you didn't know you had in the yard. <laughs> you know? Or you might be a redneck if you think a turtleneck is an ingredient to a soup. <laughs> you know? Or you might be a redneck if you got a spit cup on the end of the ironing board, you know, it might be. <laughs> Or you might be a redneck if you think the stock market's got a fence around it, you know, to keep the cows out. See, I was raised in South Mississippi. Those things just applied to me. I got that, you know. You might be a redneck if your daddy walks you to school because y'all are in the same grade. <laughs> I need to quit this. You might be a redneck if you got a homemade fur coat. <laughs> You'd have to be raised in South Mississippi to understand that. But anyway, you might be a Pharisee if. So I got a few things for you here. So ho hope this doesn't sting you too bad. And maybe you, if it does just go right over the top of your head, either you don't have any self-righteousness or you're just not getting it or you're not getting convicted. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust it's going to help us all. You might be a Pharisee if you know your Bible very well but you feel superior to other Christians. You might be a Pharisee if you know your Bible very well, but you feel you have some elite status with God over other believers. 
or you're so certain that you're right that you have become unteachable. You might be a Pharisee if you have a great deal of Bible knowledge but not much love going on. Or you might be a Pharisee if you take your opinions, inferences, speculations, and pass them off as fundamentals. Let me explain what that means. If we have a belief continuum, and on the left, on this uh, left side's essentials, and you go to the non-essentials down this line, dealing with theological or moral issues. Now, I would say on the essential side, you got your fundamentals. And then there's things that the Bible might infer about and inferences. And then there's things you might speculate about and things you might just have an opinion about. Well, what's important are your fundamentals. These are the things you don't ever compromise. I'm talking about like the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, the perfect, sinless, spotless life of Jesus Christ, the divinity of Christ, the humanity of Jesus Christ. You know, he was 100% human, 100% divine. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ascension of Jesus Christ, the, the ascending of the Holy Spirit, the inerrancy of scriptures, the reality of heaven and hell. These are fundamentals. These are things that, that you believe, that you stand for. They're in our articles of faith. You can go on our webpage and read a short little statement of our articles of faith. These are the fundamentals, the things that are really, really important. But where Christianity gets all divided is when you think you know everything about everything. That next level, I could give you an example. Inferences, like what's inferred, I could take a hundred things, but let's just take, should women preach and teach in the church? Well, I personally believe they should. That it's okay. But there's, I have a lot of good friends in Christianity that believe they shouldn't. And they got scripture to back that up. So do I break fellowship with these people over that issue? No. Let them believe that. I respect that because they have their scriptures. I have my scriptures. You know, but that, those aren't, that isn't as important as the things I just listed off as the fundamentals. Then speculations. We could talk about eschatology or the doctrine of the end times. Whether the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation, the middle of the tribulation, or after the tribulation. Whether there is a rapture at all. Do all Christians go in the rapture? Only overcoming Christians go in the rapture? A lot about the, I mean, we get in the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, and you can get all kind of ideas there. And, and I can, I could, I could invite seven different speakers that are experts on the subject, and they're going to give you seven different ideas. So you don't, you don't break your Christian fellowship just because somebody doesn't believe in the end time doctrine just the way you believe in it. And then there's opinions. That could be things like, how to do a worship service. Everybody seems to have their own ideas about how worship service should go or whether the preacher should wear a tie when he preaches or not or whether it could be over modesty issues on how you interpret modesty. You know, there's a lot, it could be about altar ministry on how we're supposed to do that. There's lots of opinions. So if you're not careful, you, you'll, you'll start, let me say this is well said, Every human being has a sinful tendency to take their opinions, inferences, and speculations and pass them off as fundamentals. In some ways, there's an insecurity inside of all of us that hates to have any belief that we are less than certain on. Why? We all want to be right. Why do we have to be right? Because we're self-righteous. <laughs> I got to be right. I'm preaching now, whether y'all realize it or not, I'm preaching. This is some good preaching right here. Oh, we want to be right. Christians fight over this stuff. Man, I'm, 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 I'm to a point now, you know, I don't want the sin of certainty. I don't want that. That thing stinks inside of you. It just smells inside of me. I want that out of me. And you say, well, you're going to get wishy-washy on the fundamentals? Never. I will live and die for the fundamentals. I will live and die 
for my belief. You know, we may have to be persecuted for our, I have been persecuted for my belief, but, but it may get in our government and the world we live in, we all might have to take persecution. No, you take a stand for what you believe in. But don't get all sideways and break the unity with other brothers and sisters on things you're just speculating about or things you just have an opinion about. All believers might have a little bit of Pharisee in their hearts. We all might need a little bit of a Pharisectomy there. <laughs> you might be a Pharisee if you like to be recognized by men for good deeds. Your giving of tithes, alms, fasting, prayers are done for public show. We're probably not as guilty there as we were on the other point. But nevertheless, it was a big deal with the Pharisees, so it's definitely a characteristics of self-righteousness. Uh, we should only live for what God thinks about us. We should live for an audience of two hands, two nail-scarred hands. If, you, if, if, if he's pleased with you, beloved one, it doesn't matter what the preacher thinks about you. It doesn't matter what your friends and your neighbors think about you. The Pharisees didn't live for the audience of God. They lived for the audience of man. I got two scriptures here. John 12, 43, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. That was Jesus' words. And John 5, 44, how can you believe you who receive honor from one another, but do not seek the honor that comes from only God? So they weren't even interested in what God thought. They were interested in what man thought about them. You might be a Pharisee if. There. You emphasize outward appearance. You live by some non-biblical or man-made standards. You look down on others that don't embrace your standards. Let me give you an example or two. I had a friend a few years ago. We were Gideons. This is going back several years ago. We were, I was a Gideon before I was a preacher. And we, what the Gideons would go out on a Gideon Sunday in one city, and we'd all speak at a church. So me and this guy were speaking at different churches. I said, well, let's meet at the restaurant after church, and we'll get a bite to eat, and we can talk about how the service went. He said, oh, no, I don't commerce on Sunday. I'm thinking, what? I, I didn't understand what a Pharisee was back in those days, but I knew that didn't sound right. I don't commerce on Sunday? Don't, you know, don't be proud of yourself for not commercing on Sunday. Je the Sabbath day is a person. Jesus picked corn on the Sabbath day. Jesus... You know, they worked on the Sabbath day. He did miracles on the Sabbath day. This, the Pharisees were all upset at him for doing all this on Saturday, that what they called the Sabbath. He fulfilled the Sabbath day. Jesus said, come unto me and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'm meek and lowly and you'll find rest unto your soul. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. So we shouldn't be bound by a day. I personally leave my stores closed on Sundays. I don't do that out of a religious law. I do that to give my employees a day off so they can go to church with their families. You know, it's just the right thing to do for the employees. Well, I appreciate y'all agreeing with that, but I don't do that because I'm not trying to not commerce on the Sabbath. It's like going to a movie theater. There was years I was taught don't go into a theater. You know, you'll miss the rapture if you get caught in a theater. The theater is not what's bad. It's the movie that might be bad. But you know, there's some great faith-based movies out there that every one of you should see. Liz and I found some movies that have been inspiring. There's a new series called The Chosen. You need to watch that. It'll, you ought to watch that 10 times. It'll make you cry every time you see it. There's tr some tremendous movies out there. So it's not the theater that's bad. It's if you go to a nasty movie, that's bad. You don't garbage in, garbage out. You don't know what, none of us need to watch nasty movies. But don't think you're righteous because you don't walk into the theater. It's not the theater. <laughs> anyway, I, I say that because I, I remember being a young man thinking, driving past the theater, man, look at those worldly people there. there. <laughs> I wouldn't be caught dead in a theater. So anyway, don't, here's another one. You might be a Pharisee if you, own a t if you don't own a TV, but you do own a computer or a phone. 
I know people proud about that. They, I don't have a TV in my house, but yet they watch all the garbage they want to watch on their computer or their smartphone. <laughs> What's the difference? Come on. You might be a Pharisee if you go beyond modesty with apparel standards. A lot of people want to know, how should we dress? How do we dress at Return Church? Well, the Bible says modesty. Go interpret that word modesty and use that. That's what the New Testament tells you. It tells you how to dress. Dress with modesty. Can I get an amen on that? Y'all are looking at me like, ah, oh, I'm going to fight you over that. Or you might be a Pharisee if you use the dietary laws from the Mosaic Covenant. I know people that do that. They won't eat the shellfish. They won't eat pork. They won't eat honey. Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament covenant. We got Hebrews 8, last verse of Hebrew 8 says that old Mosaic covenant has been made obsolete because we have a new covenant now. And that's Jesus Christ brought in a new covenant. So you might be a Pharisee if my thing will turn again. I might need a hand back there. There we go. If you don't practice what you preach, if you're a hypocrite, that seemed to be the main theme of Jesus' words in Matthew 23, he kept calling them hypocrites. If, if, if you live all sweet in public, but at home you're a hellion, you know? Some people are like that. They're just meaner than a yard dog at home, <laughs> but they put on a smile in public. You need to become the same person. You need to be sweet at home as you are in church. Jesus, uh, and the other thing, you might be a Pharisee if you judge others and point the finger without seeing yourself. You know, when you point the finger at somebody, you got three of them here pointing back at you. You need to you turn that finger around and just point it here. I'm going to read this to you. This is a familiar passage, but Matthew 7, verse 1 through 5. Judge not that you be not judged, for with judgment what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? This is New King James. One interpretation, uh, if you look that word up, it's like a tree, a big tree coming out of your eye. It, it's like me saying to Scotty, He's got a little speck in his eye, like he's this little bitty thing he's not doing right. And I'm going to come up and point the finger at him for doing that. While I'm such a hypocrite, I got a tree growing out of my face. You understand <laughs> what he's saying here? It's, he says, uh, or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye. And look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. There's no place for judgment in Christianity. Let God judge everyone. He's going to do it anyway. When we all die, the first thing's going to happen. We're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ, and we'll give an account for our life, every little thing. So it's not our job, even as pastor, it's not my job to judge you, to condemn you, to point out the speck in your eye. It's my job to get the plank out of my own eye, to get anything wrong with my life, get that fixed, and don't be trying to judge you. You might be a Pharisee if you put people on a guilt trip and you're not even aware of it. A lot of times we're just so religious, people just get around us and they feel guilty for something they got going on in their life. And you know, it's because of my behavior they're feeling guilty well, God, that's the devil putting all that guilt on people. The Holy Spirit convicts people, Christians. The devil makes you feel condemned. The Holy Spirit convicts. That's the difference right there. You shouldn't leave church if you're a Christian feeling condemned. You should leave feeling convicted. Because if you're convicted, then you can confess and repent and do business with God. Praise the Lord. All right, I'm winding her down here. You might be a Pharisee if you made your own minors, strain at a gnat, or swallow a camel. That doesn't need any more explaining. You might be a Pharisee if you compare yourself to others, finding those that live worse than you. Now, this is one of the worst traits that we fall into. We feel pretty righteous about ourselves when we go visit the jails and realize why all those people are in that jail. I can go home feeling really good about myself. Well, you, can, you don't have to go to the jails. Just go to Portland with us 
and just get, get go, talking about these people and what they're living and how they're living and what's going on in their life. If I just compared myself with them, I could feel righteous. But that, again, that's the self-righteousness in me. I shouldn't, I shouldn't want to compare myself with anybody but Jesus. And when you compare yourself against him, you realize how unrighteous you are. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. Thank you. And, uh, and if my righteousness is filthy rags, the only way I can get it cleaned is get on my knees and come back to him and ask for the grace of God to wash me clean. See, the blood of Jesus is always there. There's a river of crimson blood flowing at all times. And you can get washed in that with one simple prayer, one simple act of faith. Jesus, wash me, cleanse me, make me righteous. That's how righteousness comes. It's imputed. It's given to you by God. All right, you might be a Pharisee if you work real hard at being righteous. You might be a Pharisee if you think you know how to do church and you know it the right way, and you're inwardly critical for all who do it differently than you. I'll just let that lie right there. <laughs> you might be a Pharisee if you're not aware of your inward sins and your thought life. See, Jesus had to really get on to them about this because, you know, if they did something visibly outwardly, like the lady in adultery, remember how they caught her in the act of adultery and drug her out in the... And the, to the temple and brought her to Jesus and we caught her in the very act and they're ready to stone her. Well, Jesus, when he got on them about their thought life, remember he said, if you lust after a woman, you've already committed the act of adultery if you, in your thought life. Or if you call your brother a fool or hate your brother, that's just as bad as murder. So he was always into our thought life. See, because Real Christianity is about the inward condition of the heart. Religion is all about the outward show. It doesn't matter what their thoughts were. That's why he called them whited sepulchers. That means uh, like a tombstone, all pretty on the outside, but full of dead men's bones on the inside. So your thought, if, you're, you're, if you think you, you're only convicted of the sins that you do, the deeds, and you're not even convicted over your sinful thought life, you might be a Pharisee. Well, that got everybody right there, one swipe. Wow. There's a solution to that. Have a bad thought, then have your next thought right behind it. Lord Jesus, wash me in your blood. Lord Jesus, I didn't mean to think that. Just cleanse me. See, you'll live under the fountain of blood. You'll think about the wonderful cross all day long. You'll think about the grace of God all day long. You're, you will live a righteous life, but it's going to come out of, out of the relationship with Jesus. As he touches you with his grace, you'll be gra- grateful. And out of gratitude, you'll live a righteous life. Okay, this is the big one. You might be a Pharisee. If every time I've said the word Pharisee today, you thought of someone else. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> You just can't help it, can you? Your mind goes there. You think, oh, I know who he's talking about. I do. I know who he's talking about. What was Job's problem? Self-righteousness. The Bible, man, he was, he got great. He did better in the first couple chapters than I could ever do. He lost all his children. He lost all his possessions and he never sinned. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed, his wife even came to him and said, you need to curse God. And you know, all he, all he had left was a nagging wife. I mean, he lost everything but that wife. And he, that's it. That's all he had left. But in chapter 3, the, the Lord allowed the devil to touch his body. And his body became full of sores and boils. And now he was so miserable in verse 1 of chapter 3, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job spoke and said, May the day perish on which I was born. And if you look at the next 30-something chapters, maybe 38 chapters more, you hear Job's complaint. Now, there's a few times he said some really powerful things. I know my Redeemer liveth. He's going to try me like gold. I'm going to come through the fire. I mean, there's a few times he was able to get the truth out just a little bit. 
But look, look at the kind of things he said. Look at Job 27, 5. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me, my righteousness I hold fast, and will not let it go. Job 31, 6. Let me be weighed on honest scales that God may know my integrity. In other words, I'm not being tried right. This is unfair. God doesn't even see my integrity here. Look at verse 32, 1. So these three men cease answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. That's when his friends finally gave up. Job 33, 9. I am pure without transgressions. I am innocent. There is no iniquity in me. Job 34, 5. For Job has said, I am righteous. That's scary stuff. But sometimes we behave that way, whether we say it or not. We got this inward thing going on, trying to be right, deflecting, blaming, defending others, pointing the finger, judging. You know, it's in us whether we can see it or not. And the good news at the end of Job's suffering, the Bible says after the Lord had communicated with him, he used Elihu, the mediator, and then the Lord spoke out of a whirlwind to Job and finally got his attention. And he said, I've heard you by the hearing of the eye, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. See, it's okay when you see the self-righteousness in your heart. Just repent. Just tell the Lord you're sorry. Confess it to him. It's simple. 1 John 1.8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth's not in us. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How simple it is to get rid of the Pharisee in our heart. Just confess it. Just confess to the Lord, and he'll, he'll remove it. Are y'all following that? Are right, these three comments are the key to the whole lesson. And then I'm closing. Our righteousness has nothing to do with our behavior. God graciously applies righteousness to our sin-drenched souls out of pure generosity. You like that? It's got nothing to do with your behavior got everything to do with God imputing his righteousness onto us. Righteousness is not the reward of, right, of living rightly. It's the unmerited gift that once understood irresistibly results in right living. Is, right, I'll say that again. Righteousness is not the reward of living rightly. It's the unmerited gift that once understood irresistibly results in right living. And then finally, living righteously comes out of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the righteous one. We live right out of gratitude for the grace that has been poured upon us through Jesus Christ. It's all about him. Matthew 5, 20, Jesus said, I say unto you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. See how serious this is? Your righteousness got to exceed that. And they did all of this. They studied the scriptures. They prayed. They fasted. They were separated. They did all this stuff. And that wasn't good enough. Being religious won't get you into heaven any more than being irreligious keeps you out. You can be irreligious or religious. You can be the prodigal son or the big brother. Either way, you miss out. The only way we're ever going to get into heaven is to let Jesus Christ forgive our sins, wash our sins away with his precious blood, and then he'll impute his righteousness onto us. When he graciously gives me that imputed righteousness, then I can live right. Now I'm in right with God, not based on what I did, but based on what Jesus did for me 2,000 years ago, the gospel. We're back to the gospel. Are you kidding me, man? That's the greatest news in the history of the world. It's imputed righteousness. Romans 4, for what, does, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. You believe God and he'll put the righteousness on you. Many were made righteous. Romans 5.18 says, as far as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. That's Adam. So also by, the man's, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Many's are going to be made righteous by who? One man's obedience, Jesus' obedience, not by our righteous deeds. So the summary, there's a little bit of a Pharisee in all of us. 
because we were born self-righteous. Number two, we need to be more aware of it so we confess and repent. Number three, I'm as needy today of the blood of Jesus Christ as I was 33 years ago, the day I got born again. If we allow God to do a fair sectomy on us, we can increase our intimacy with God. Just think of the relationship. Just think of the union you can have with Christ if you get rid of this thing that's been separating you from him. And the foundation of our relationship with Jesus is built upon his imputed righteousness on our sinful souls. That's what it's all built upon. It's not built on my good behavior. It's built upon his good behavior. Jesus lived the perfect life, the one that we can never live. He lived it for us, and now he'll live it through us. Now that he lives in me, he'll live his life through me. You say, well, you're teaching against right living. No, I'm telling you how to live right. This is the only way to live right is through your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You want to... Uh, we got a new members class. I want to remind you of that. I was going to, let me tell you another redneck joke. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. This was just a heavy subject. I had to say something kind of funny today. This is a heavy subject, all right? I need to break the ice a little bit. But I hope you all see this. I hope you all see it like I see it. It's going to help me in my walk with the Lord, and I pray that it does help you also. Amen. 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 So if you want to be a member of Return Church and you never officially joined, there's this little class we go through. Brother Chad made a video, and then Brother Steve Manneke is going to take the rest of the class. It won't take long, hour, maybe hour and a half. I think you can probably do it in less than an hour and a half, and you can be an official voting member of Return. We'd love to have you join, so feel free to stay after church if you'd like to do that. Don't forget next Sunday's Easter Sunday. So bring a friend. Bring your kids and all your grandkids and all their friends. Let's just fill the place up and have a wonderful resurrection Sunday. Would y'all stand, please, and we'll pray. I'm going to ask Brother Steve Manneke to come up here and close the service. While he comes, we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We love your word. You promised that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish the thing wherein you sent it. Lord, so we just trust you and the Holy Spirit that this word will change our lives, that it will help us, Lord, overcome this problem of self-righteousness. Lord Jesus, I don't want any of it in me anymore. I want you to cut it out of me, take it away, and just wash me all over again in your precious blood. One more time, Lord Jesus, I receive the righteousness that you died to give me, and I walk in your righteousness and not my own. Lord, I just pray for every soul here today that you would just wash us all, cleanse us all in the beautiful fountain of your crimson blood. Thank you for the wonderful cross. In the cross, in the cross, Lord Jesus, that's where all of our hope is found. That's where our faith is. That's where our life is. So just wash us all in your precious blood. Bless your people as they go today. Bless them in their homes and in their work and their ministries. And bring them back to your house at your next appointed time. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen.